China also you know, announced that they're going to invest $100 billion in more Belt and Road projects around the world. So, you know, it's it now let's be honest and let's be very mm-hmm. fair here. Is China investing in the same way that they were before? Of course not. Uh, it, it is definitely much reduced. I think there's much more scrutiny to the projects that they are going to invest in because, quite frankly, you know, some of them have not turned out as well as China would have hoped. But let's also keep in perspective that China has over 1,300 projects around the world. Um, Alex, you know this as you and I both trade the stock markets. You right. know, when you're having a, a, a portfolio of stocks, you're not going to have, you know, 20 winners. You know, you're going to have some are, uh, you know, outstanding, some are average, and some are going to be below par, and some might even fail. So if you you have somebody on the board of trustees watching those investments, they may be able to steer the ship in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're going to see a a little bit more of a tightening. I mean, certainly when China started the Belt and Road Initiative, I mean, I think they were very much just handing out cash and pretty much signing off on anything. Like, yeah, let's just Mm -hmm. get as many projects as we can going and, you know, maybe try to expand a little bit too fast, too aggressively. There has been a lot of successful projects. I do want to mention that. I think that's really important to understand. And I think that China wants to be a a global player here. And, you know, they have their seat at the table. They are a rising global superpower. And I think that's what we're seeing with the situation we talked to Israel and Palestine. Why, you know, this, I mean, here's the proof in the pudding where, why is it that all of these Muslim countries say the ne- the first stop is China? We're going to Beijing and we are going to negotiate and we're going to send delegates from 12 Muslim countries to Beijing in an effort to try to get this to be a ceasefire. And that was a very powerful statement, I think, because they're not going to Washington, D.C. They're coming to Beijing. Obviously, Beijing had already organized a peace deal, a peace treaty between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which the United States certainly wasn't able to do. Um, but China was able to do that. So I think there needs to be more credit given to China. Um, again, I, th- I think that they are a rising superpower. I wouldn't say that they have as much leverage as the United States on the international stage. But you know, there, but we do see China growing in the global south. And I think that is uh, something that I have mm-hmm. been really focusing on this year with my vlogs, just the voice of the global south, why they are wanting to continue to work with China. It's very powerful reasons, Alex. I mean, there, I saw, for example... There was, I think it was Secretary of Tra- of Commerce, you know, basically saying, you know, trying to limit China's, uh, what is it, the EV batteries and everything. And it's like, look, if anybody in the European market or the African market or the Latin American market wants to do this, we need to actively sanction them and go after them. And it's like, oh, wow. So now the United States is going to dictate who can do business with China. Uh, you know, I mean, and again, it's it's there's a reason why Africa is choosing China. And I made a very big breakdown on that earlier this year. I did a breakdown of like the Belt and Road Initiative. Actually, we've done many Belt and Road Initiative breakdowns talking about Africa, Latin America, the Middle East. All those videos have gone over a million views because those so many people from those countries are like, Cyrus, thanks for making a video about this because, hey, I'm from Africa. This is what's happening in my country. Hey, I'm from Bolivia. This is what's happening in my country. This is what's happening in my continent. And we need to have a bit different perspective, which... You know, I have, again, living in the United States, we have, I was meeting some friends in Washington, D.C. over the weekend, and they're like, we, not only do we not understand world politics or world events, we don't even understand local events. Like, I mean, because you, if you're like, if you're in Washington, D.C., you only pay attention to what's happening in Washington, D.C. So we don't, we don't, we don't even do a good job of understanding the United States domestically. So that's why a lot of Americans really don't understand, you know, again, what's going on internationally. And Again, I got the Colonel Douglas McGregor coming on for two more videos this uh, this week, which I'm excited to share. He breaks down a lot of that. Well, I want to continue to talk about the BRI, and then I'll explain a couple of things that uh, some papers I got in front of me here. But um, China has signed agreements uh, and invested in approximately 153 nations already. They are one to one first trading partners. Uh, that means you know the largest trading partners to those com- countries. Uh, there's over 115 of them, which is China is their first number one trading partner. So when we see, uh, you know, people say, well, I don't think China is directly going to invest in Ukraine. Well, pretty much every other country around it has yeah. uh, China's support, whether it's in infrastructure. Now, what China does is quite interesting. They're going to go into the country and they're going to say, OK, look, you know, we understand the infrastructure is one thing, but 
they also go in there and they try to influence the financial system by saying, okay, guys, you got to lend out to small businesses. What that means is you got to start opening up some local banks. Of course, we're going to do the first round of maybe some funding to these banks. But your loans officers that used to be, you know, this is what built kind of America and Canada's economy. That loan officer that worked at that small credit union, that branch manager in the subdivision that would bring a family in. Hey, this is your first house. Are you going to buy a car? Are you going to invest in a business? And those people on the ground, those branch managers, those little loans officers, those bank managers, those credit unions, as they start to spread out and build and help support the economy, that economy can finally then survive. And then immediately it has that infrastructure in place. Uh, it's, it's very easy to see. I used to run a, an online business and seeing how fast logistics used to come from China when we started the business. We, our only way of getting goods uh, to Europe, where our uh, fulfillment company was, was by cargo ship. And then right. four or five years into it, that shrunk to air freight. And then air freight was you know, kind of a slow, uh, costly way of getting it. Well, by the time uh, we, before, just before we sold the company and stuff like that, that it, it took approximately only three days to get the stuff uh, into to Europe, which is, is quite interesting. Now, that has a lot. You can see the logistical chains of DHL. You can see the logistical chains of many com companies that use this platform. If you're looking at Africa, you can go all the way down the line. You can see, okay, what African country has put you know a rail system in there now? Right. Uh, what country has put a, a port in there? This all really makes sense if you look at it from a global standpoint and just follow that whole supply chain coming from Europe as it zigzags all across right back to China. And I'm going to bring you up the city I'm living in right now, Chongqing. And we're going to talk about the new energy vehicles just for a quick, because uh, you brought it up. <laughs> so that's why I'm going to sure. talk about it. Sure, sure. There is a big misunderstanding in NEV vehicles here in China. And I seem to, and you're on the other side of the water there. So I, I'm going to really pick your brain about this. Yeah. Most people that I've been talking to in North America and Canada first start by saying uh, cheap automobiles. I wouldn't drive an NEV if you paid me or unreliable or battery fire or, uh, you know, not difficult to charge. I'm in a city of 34 million people, Cyrus. Yeah. Every single day, I continually see, you know, oh. service stations that are mothballed. I am seeing more green license plates. Yeah, I'm seeing cooler cars. I just sat in. I was at Neo's showroom this week. Do you know that Neo's showroom? And Neo is a ener new energy vehicle. They believe in. Oh God, they're going to kick me my butt for forgetting this. But it's called. They use battery swapping. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of that, but you go to Neo. They have all this infrastructure all throughout China. Massive investment. Okay, massive investment. You buy a Neo car, you drive it four or five hours. Now you might say, "Oh, I've got to pull over. I've got to maybe maybe we'll charge it for a couple of hours and then we'll get back on the road." Nope. Battery swapping. Move into there. The 2.0 platform can change swap out an old battery, put a new battery in your car in six or seven minutes. The 3.0, uh, which is the, the charging station, it's like, a, it's like a, a, a car wash. You drive it in there, you stop, automatically it goes under the car, takes bolts out by, by you know, uh, robotics, battery drops out, they pop another one in, three or four minutes later, you're back on the road again. Yeah. And this whole entire network and how they've set up the purchasing of a car, when you buy a car, you become part of the com a community and people talk about software updates and stuff like that. I've never been in a car where uh, the seats start to warm up. A fireplace comes on the display, classical music sitting there, and right. uh, somebody can drive the car for you. For cars that were as, and I don't want to use you real cheap, as affordable as forty to 45000 that's for what they call mid-luxury to luxury uh, going up to about you know, 60, 75, 80,000. Now right. we think, oh, 
there's only one or two car players here. No, there's a lot of, uh, you know, automobiles here. Some automobiles like the Wuling, you can get into it. Little, It's like a little smart car here. Five grand, five yeah. $5,000. You want to trade it in? Don't like it? Okay, no problem. Uh, but some of these other cars are are quite amazing. And this, I just can't understand uh, why there is such a, you know, a, a pushback in North America against these cars. I'm wondering if it's lobbyists that are uh, aligned with oil and gas companies that say, mm, any yeah. cars are good, let's well, go with the lobbyists on that. Or is it the United Auto Workers? And if you're from the UAW on here, uh, I trust uh, <laughs> that you guys are going through a, a change of, uh, we'll call it disruptive technology. Right. Uh, and hopefully the company that you're working for is ready for it. Because I'm going to tell you right now, Yes, there's going to be some failures in the new energy vehicle market here. But when I walk out in a city of 34 million people and I see a blue sky out front of my door every morning and these cars whipping around, not one yeah. in a hundred, but almost every second car, it's coming no matter what you want. And here's, here's the unfortunate thing, and they're going to hand it over to you, is – this could actually really change people's lives in North America. The oh, cost, what? the cost of running these cars per month is 85% less than actually a, a petrol car. I, right. I talked to a guy, I said, what did you used to spend on gas a month? Oh, I don't know, six, seven hundred dollars a month. You know, I two hour commute day each day, da 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 da. He switched to new energy. How much you, you spend it a month? About 40 to 50 dollars. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt about that. That it's at uh, the cost advantage, and I think I'll, I'll answer your question, Alex. You know why? Why there's a little bit of resistance. I mean, what's what's interesting? First of all, is I want to go first talk about the China market because what we're seeing in China is that I, I have actually a, a video that I'm making about EVs, and what we're seeing for the for this is the best way to sum it up. For decades, China has been looking to the West and trying to learn information, trying to learn technology. Um, you know, again, you know, even even been accused of copycatting things and really mm. trying to steal technology from the West. But in a complete reversal, we're now at a point now where Western companies are buying stakes in Chinese EV companies to get access to Chinese technology. Just again, think about that for a second. We have made a complete reversal here. Before, China always needed information from the West and wanted to learn more. Now, China is so much more advanced in this particular industry that the opposite is happening. So Volkswagen took out a 700 billion, sorry, 700 million investment in Xpeng to access their wow. technology. And there's another um, conglomerate company that made an even larger investment of a $1.6 billion. And basically... Saying, saying, you know, we need to get access to this Chinese technology to help our EVs in Europe. What you're, what you're going to see ultimately, though, Alex, is that at the end of the day, these new designs coming out of China are better, faster, slicker, more features, and much more affordable. And at the end of the day, people want to have affordable things and have things that are nice. I, I tell you, an example is uh, looking at the TV market. You know, for example, there's the uh, Vivo, which uh, had sponsored some of the big college football games here. You know, the, all of a sudden, you know, you go to something like a Costco here in the United States. You've got a, your 60-inch TV. Okay, this one's from Sony. It costs $1,200. This one's Vivo, um, you know, from China, and it costs $500. Okay, and you're looking at them side by side in the store, and you're like, actually, I think that the $500 one's actually a little bit better uh, <laughs> quality here. Like, it's it's it, what, what is the difference here? Are we just paying for the uh, for the Sony logo on this one? So, you know, you've seen, you know, the the, the sales have skyrocketed. You know, they partnered with the World Cup as an official sponsor. So, you know, there's 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 sales have absolutely skyrocketed. And a lot of people, myself included, I'm like, wait, I'm going to buy the Vivo, the Vivo TV because, you know, I don't care if it's made in China or elsewhere. I'm looking for the most affordable price and the best quality as a result of that. You know, what we're also seeing is there's been a lot of reports where that China is becoming very smart and they're actually opening up. Um, car manufacturers in Mexico, and they're accessing, they're going to be accessing the North American market, you know, via Mexico. And that's actually something that is that a lot of people aren't talking about as well, is that a lot of people are, oh, look at all these manufacturers that are leaving China because China is so mm -hmm. 
you know, mm-hmm. is so expensive to manufacture. It's actually a lot of Chinese companies that are building factories in places like Mexico and Vietnam to also take advantage of the cheaper labor. It is no doubt about it. You know, labor in China is much more expensive. It's to the mm-hmm. tune of a seven times increase in the last 23 years. You know, from you look at the wages in 2000 to 2023, you know, when you factor in insurances, pensions, you know, all of these things, you know, China has modernized and it's not like they've killed their manufacturing sector. It's just gotten better. It's gotten more dialed in. It's gotten better for the workers as well. More, more, much more of an international structure with pensions and insurances, et cetera. So what's interesting though, is that again, there is a lot of, um, you know, the EV market is very hot right now. And I think that China has a dominant, there is a dominant lead in that. And I think ultimately you're going to see Chinese companies breaking into the European markets. You're going to see them breaking into the American markets. Now, of course, from the Republican side, they're going to, you know, you're going to get someone like a Gordon Chang who is going to, well, well, China is going to bring Mm -hmm. EV cars into America and then they're going to be able to remote control them from China and cause terrorism, you know, or spying. (laughs) Um, And then you've certainly got a lot of Republicans who are not buying into the climate change and saying, you know, we need to do fossil fuels and we need to, you know, gas cars are the future or or, or not the future, but it's, it is the best thing for now and for the long haul. And, but again, you brought up a good point, you know, with America and politicians, you always have to think about the lobbyists because no one is really acting in American politicians don't act in the interest of people or the country. They act in their own interest. And this is why these lobbyists, which is basically just legalized corruption, are able to go in. And it is exactly why, for example, the gun problem will never be solved in America because the National Rifle Association pays way too much money to to right-wing politicians to make sure that that Second Amendment never changes and that that basically we are able to sell as many guns as possible because it's highly profitable and it's a very robust industry. And we sell this propaganda of, oh, you need a gun to protect yourself from the government. You know, just in case that government comes knocking on your door, you can protect yourself, uh, which is just nonsense. So, you know, again, I'm quite heated on that one. I'm very, yeah. very uh, traumatized by the gun, the gun crime that does exist in this country. And and simply, you know, simply the, the, the crime that has just gotten, you know, like... Um, what what is it the type of crimes like um assaults and all of these very um hard crimes in america i mean it's up like 200 percent this year you know i mean it's mm. a 200 percent increase in violent crime in the united states and it's across the board through major cities i mean you have to very much watch yourself when you're in major cities and you know i know that's something you have no idea what that means alex living mm-hmm. in china because as we know china is one of the safest countries in the world and that is just the cold hard truth there uh, there's no yeah. propaganda in that it is just anyone that has been there can certainly um go there but yeah i mean alex we've crossed a thousand people on my side of the stream i think you've got probably a bit more we've got a lot of people here so just want to say thanks everybody i um you know appreciate everybody's uh being here today i still think we got some we got some time so just wanted to say thanks. yes i i want to uh also uh thank everybody for joining the program as well I, I brought this little uh, quote up here, Gregory. I would never even buy an EV bicycle. Everything EV is overpriced, impossible to repair, and unreliable. Possibly in the United States uh, or wherever you're um, quoting that from, <laughs> whatever country uh, you're comparing that to. But let me give you, Gregory, an example of an um, EV bike or an EV scooter. Uh, I have two of them I use throughout the city here, and this city is the size of... Oh, it's bigger than New York, uh, population-wise, 34 million people. Um, I charged it this weekend. Uh, It will last me two weeks. This is a a scooter that can take two people throughout the city. It will cost me 80 cents uh, to uh, pretty much fully charge that for two weeks of usage. I've had it for two years. The cost of that, uh, the luxury model cost of that scooter uh, was 684 US dollars for that. That's the high end one. And the lower end one for the other part of the city uh, cost me $350 brand new for those. So um, would I? Would you not buy that? Well, I'll leave you to uh, think and contemplate that. Another one here is, this is a usual line that we always see, not convinced mining using child labor for lithium, cobalt, nickel is ongoing. These minerals are not as plentiful as some people seem to think. Uh, maybe you want to uh, not type that on the iPhone that uses that type of batteries. Um, so when you look at this, 
once again, this is the kind of stuff when you see these people and they come and they say, it's unreliable. It's uh, not made very well. Uh, China steals uh, this technology. Huawei, the company Huawei here in China, is one of the largest patent holders in the world. Okay. They're investing in patents. Um, okay. Drone technology. Whose technology is that? Let's call it from the consumer part. DJI, I would have to say, are pretty much the major brand for drones if you're going to buy it from a commercial standpoint. Right. Well, they didn't steal that from America, okay? America gets their mobile phones manufactured over here in China, okay? Right. Uh, why? Mm, reliability. Components are high price. And this is the thing about the big misunderstanding about China, where people say China makes cheap goods. The reason why China makes sometimes cheap goods is because you have to remember who the intermediary is or who the actual buyer is to sell it to the consumer. If it's a, a, a buyer like Walmart and they say, okay, we only want to spend 10 cents on a tea mug. Okay, you know, the Chinese factory say, all right, yeah, we could probably make it for 10 cents. The buyer at Walmart is fine. He's happy. He puts it on the shelves. He sells it for a good markup. People go home. They have maybe two weeks, and then the, the tea mug breaks, and they say cheap Chinese goods. Yeah. But if you go to China and you say, we're going to pay uh, this for this device, and we're going to pay that. And you got to remember, not much profit is made in China on iPhones. No. Most of that profit is moved over to America and uh, made by uh, the company in California, okay? Or unless it's headquarters in, in Ireland for tax purposes. But we seem to forget that most of the stuff out here, and, and you'll hear cheap Chinese labor, sorry, that boat has sailed, as Cyrus said, many years ago. The cheap Chinese labor boat has sailed a long, long, long time ago. The, the cost of labor here is more expensive, and that's where China has said, okay, the BRI is the way to go. Uh, let's move manufacturing to this country. Let's move it to that country. They're not shy to move their factories anymore. And people just say, oh, well, I'm going to invest in Mexico. Uh, I can guarantee you the Chinese are heavily invested in Mexico. <laughs> Absolutely. So, 